called the ERC for, well, the, the whole six-year project, <laughs> of which this is a small piece. Uh, and then also, you'll notice we're not at SOAS. We're at the friend's house because we couldn't find any room at SOAS. Uh, so I'd also like to thank the uh, Society of Friends for being our gracious hosts today. Um, otherwise, I'll just get started with my paper. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to start a little bit uh, philosophical, which is when we're doing historical linguistics, what is data? Uh, what's our relationship to data? So in order to simplify matters, I've taken an example not from the Burmish languages, but from uh, Gothic. So the Gothic language is more or less only attested in one book, uh, which is the Codex <coughs> Argenteus, which since the 17th century has been in the library of Uppsala University. So this I am calling an artifactual primary source. So it's uh, someone used speech and that has somehow been recorded in a physical substance in a way that it exists today and can be consulted. Uh, but not everyone can necessarily go to uh, Uppsala, so sorry for the size here, but on the left we have the uh, kind of traditional prestige Locus Classicus edition of the Gothic Bible. It's called Die Gotische bei Bibel, and it was uh, by Wilhelm Streitberg uh, in 19, between 1908 and 1910. So this I'm calling an editorial primary source. So it's, it's a representation of the artifactual primary source in a way that's more convenient for consultation uh, just by virtue of being in libraries, for instance, but also potentially because it's transliterated or has some scholarly ap apparatus that makes it more um, convenient to consult than the, the artifactual primary source. And then the next level of sort of epistemological distance uh, that I would like to suggest is what I call a secondary source. Here is an example. This is a, a book. Um, it's a dictionary of biblical Gothic by Brian Regan. So the nice thing about Gothic is all, all the words in this dictionary are in this book, right? Because <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we only have one book for this language. Um, and uh, a sort of my conceptualization here is that a historical linguist in his work may find it more convenient to consult a secondary source, but in principle, any claim that's being made can be traced back to the artifactual primary source. And uh, a good historical linguist would, if, if, a, if using a, a, a piece of information for an argument, would always trace it back at least to the editorial primary source so that he felt confident it wasn't you know, a typo or something like that. So in the case of the Burmish languages, so this is the Burmish languages. Uh, they're spoken uh, at, at the border between Burma and China. And there's sort of around uh, eight or nine of them. Only Burmese has a written tradition. And uh, so this, this kind of model I've presented for Gothic uh, works very well for Burmese because they have a written tradition, mostly stone inscriptions from the 11th to 14th century in, ter in terms of old Burmese, it has very poor philological resources. So that makes it quite inconvenient as a historical linguist to work with. But the other languages are all modern. So this, um, this tripartite scheme of artifactual primary source uh, editorial primary source and secondary source, how does it map onto uh, languages with no literary tradition? And what I would suggest there is something like a, a, a physical record of the speech, like a wax cylinder or a wave file would be the artifactual primary source. <coughs> and then a transcription of that, for instance, in, in electronic format would be an editorial primary source. And then an article, a scholarly article or book or something with an argument, a grammar, a dictionary, would be a secondary source. And one thing that's very lamentable, I think, is linguists tend to skip the first two, and they go straight from 
their field work to their publication without ever making available somewhere the artifactual or the editorial primary source. Uh, there's no artifactual or editorial primary sources for the Burmish languages. And even in Sino-Tibetan, I would say there are only two languages that I feel like have kind of satisfactory coverage in this way. And they're, 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 one is Japuk and the other one is uh, Yongning Na. Uh, both have been worked on by uh, people at the CNRS in Paris who have, who have put really hundreds of hours of uh, records online, both with the recording and the transcription. So, so in our research, we can't use primary sources because they don't exist, which is frustrating. Uh, so instead, this is the kind of sources we are working with, uh, which are word lists. And uh, we have word lists made by <laughs> missionaries or diplomatic officers in British colonial times, word lists made by uh, Chinese field workers from the 50s until now, and then very recently, uh, word lists from the sort of 1980s until now uh, by missionaries associated with the Summer Institute of Linguistics. The British ones tend to be organized alphabetically by, by the English definition, whereas the other two sources are organized according to some predefined list of meanings. So the Chinese, for instance, they always start with the word for sky. Yeah, and, and those of you who know about the Chinese indigenous lexicographical tradition, that will, that will seem familiar. Okay, so now on to uh, oops, okay. etymological dictionaries. We're writing an etymological dictionary. So here we have a little entry from a German etymological dictionary with the point just being that it's hard to read. Uh, I mean, you might find it hard to read because it's small. But um, <laughs> it's, it's also hard to read because it's full of acronyms and bibliographic things. And it's not so well organized that it's machine readable. So it's both hard to read for a human being and impossible to read for a computer. Um, so we have tried to model here the information in this entry in terms of the relationship between you know, the Latin words. And uh, uh, this is fruct, which comes from fructus in Latin. And the Latin word goes back to bre in, in, uh, in the European, uh, which is, um, uh, what's the German word? Is the same thing, brauchen, yeah. So the same Indo-European uh, form becomes brauchen through inheritance in, in German. So we've tried to model this here. And in our own efforts, we're trying to have some explicit models so that these, uh, this data is kind of both human and uh, machine readable. And then in this next uh, chart, let's say, if you're, doing, if you're writing software or something like uh, Wikipedia articles, every line of, let's call it code, that someone changes, it's version controlled. So at the microscopic level, you can look at any moment what did the thing look like. Uh, and then over time, you can have some sort of uh, representation like this, where each color is a, a different user. And, and then you see the lines of code that are written by those different users. Uh, and it would be nice if something like an etymological dictionary, we could represent in this way. So you knew who contributed which ideas when uh, and watch the knowledge sort of expand over time. But in fact, you know, it, if, if someone writes a new dictionary of, uh, etymological dictionary of a language like Latin, 90% of the information, 90, probably 99% is old, but there's no explicit model of um, what's old, what's new, uh, what's original, where are the disagreements. So uh, that's something we would like to, uh, we would like to make more explicit. Uh, so our aim uh, is to digitize all of the relevant secondary sources. Uh, but we're starting at this one, Huang 1992. Oh, sorry, we have digitized them all. But uh, now we need to do something with that. <laughs> and we're starting with Huang 1992 because this one book has uh, about 2,000, we call them concepts. They're just English words. No, they're Chinese words uh, translated into eight or so Burmish languages. So it's one source that gives you a kind of 
coverage of the whole thing. And then we'll supplement that with other sources. Yeah, so then talking about the specifics of our project, uh, we have the, we have the, 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 the source like this. You know, it's a, a page of a book. We have it digitized, uh, if necessary, by copying it out manually. Uh, but better to use OCR and maybe subcontract it to a company that specializes in this sort of thing. And then for each point, we have three pieces of information. Uh, the form, the meaning, and the language. So uh, I'll give the example. Here we have the word uh, tian is sky, <laughs> but the source says tian, yeah. Uh, and it's pronounced muk in this language. And the language I would call in English maru, but in Chinese it's called langsu. So uh, we need to normalize that, which is to say, make that comparable with other sources. So we have to say uh, tian means sky, where sky is not the normal English word sky, but it's some sort of arbitrary reference point that we will map other words meaning sky to in other sources. Uh, we will normalize the phonetics, which in this case it's already written in the IPA, so it's, it's quite easy. You just normalize it with itself. But for the missionary sources, for instance, they might use CH for the CH sound, where we need to normalize that into how that would be written in IPA. And then uh, we need to normalize the language names so that we know that Maru and Langsu are the same thing. And for that, we use these standardized lists uh, like the ISO codes and the Glottolog codes. All right, so once we have that all normalized and in CSV files, we have a piece of software uh, that my partner has uh, made called the Edictor, which is a editor, uh, sort of a software platform for editing etymological dictionaries. And I, I won't uh, talk now about the guts of it because that's about how we do our research and the methodology of historical linguistics, and it's not about data management per se. Uh, but basically, we, you know, if if I can put it in the best possible light, we click a few buttons, and then we get something like this, where systematic correspondences uh, between words in the different languages are just presented to you as a user. Uh, and then, uh, then you can reconstruct the protoform, uh, and then even the, the computer will allow you to test how predictive your protoforms are. Uh, that's the part we're working on right now. It doesn't quite exist yet. So now, just uh, jumping to the back of this, I have some screenshots. So this is the software, the Edictor, where we have, uh, this is the sort of default uh, page if you just open up the, uh, the system. So we have the meaning here above, and then, because it's alphabetical, right, by English, and then all and uh, these are the different languages. These are different codes for keeping track of the morphemes. Uh, this is the IPA representation. And then this is where the computer is keeping track of, it knows, for instance, that a T is a voiceless dental stop. Uh, and then the colors are associated with different classes of uh, sounds. Uh, so that's the system. And then this is our GitHub page, which is where we have all, the, all the, the digitized primary sources. And we have a little checklist for each primary source. Have we normalized the meanings? Have we normalized the forms? Have we normalized the language names? So all of our sort of workflow is happening on the GitHub. I would say one problem we have is we tend to keep reverting to communicating over email rather than through the issue tracker on the GitHub page. And so that's, if you like, one point of data management that we're struggling with. Uh, but in principle, then, everything we're doing is here online uh, on the GitHub page uh, until we finish, if you like. Uh, <clears throat> when we write up this article, for instance, we do it in this system, which is called uh, Overleaf. Uh, it's a LaTeX system. So here's where you write the LaTeX code. And then you get a PDF reproduced in real time. So for me, as a kind of LaTeX uh, 
idiot. This solves a lot of the problems uh, of using LaTeX where you have to have a compiler and you get an error message and it doesn't compile. But in real time, it's compiling all the time and you can see what your document looks like. And then also, um, Modest and I can be logged into the file at the same time, you know, him in Germany, me in London. Uh, it's no problem. So it's a great environment for collaborative research uh, paper writing. Uh, so that's uh, one system. And then this is uh, Zenodo, where you know, once we are ready for publication, there's a certain amount of data or a certain amount of code associated with that publication, which then at the time of submission, we file uh, with Zenodo so that it's there you know, forever for everyone's enjoyment. Um, and then also that you know, Zenodo provides, it's not here, actually, it's a little bit further down. It provides a standard way that you can cite this data deposit. It associates a DOI with it that then you can use in your bibliography. Uh, so that's, those are the different systems we have. So just over, you know, now summing up, we, we get the, the data, which is only secondary data because the primary sources don't exist. Uh, we digitize that, we normalize that, we put it in the edictor system, we switch it all about, <laughs> then we publish some research on the basis of it, uh, which we write in the overview system, and we deposit the data then in Zenodo, and then the one thing in my summary I uh, left out then is while we're switching it all about, uh, that is all kept track of at least in principle on our GitHub page. So that's it. And uh, if I have extra time. You, you're happy on time, yes. OK, then I guess we can take some questions. Uh, you, I would also invite you to clap. <laughs> process of doing this, you are recording for posterity part of your sort of academic personal workflow. Right? Beyond the intellectual historians of the 22nd century, right, who will obviously be over the moon to discover in the rubble of London, <laughs> right, a memory stick containing a copy of this, right? <laughs> what purpose does that serve? As opposed to what you're recording about the primary sources, what, do, what purpose does it serve usefully, you think, to have a record of the construction of your particular secondary source? Uh, so I think on the one hand, uh, it serves no ultimate purpose. Um, the 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 submission to Zenodo is the important part in terms of this is the data that we used and this is the code that we applied it to. Um, that's what's important. The stuff on the GitHub page of like, um, you know, it was on April 22nd that we digitized this source or something, it's not of any importance, I think, once the project is over. However, I think it is important that we feel comfortable uh, exposing that to the public, you know, because if if we if we want to hide something, it means we're embarrassed by it. Yeah, like oh, we're very far behind digiting, digitizing our sources. So <laughs> I think it's it's it, it's good discipline to say, you know, this is this is not my private life here. This is my mm -hmm. this is my public life, and it's my job. Uh, so everything should be out uh, in the open. Yeah. Is Can I that press you on that? Sure. I think that an alternative viewpoint that somebody might take yeah. is that while I'm perfectly happy in a sense to share how I work and explain to somebody that for every good idea I put down on a published page, there were ten really stupid ones beforehand. I don't necessarily want to share the ten really stupid ideas hmm? that led to the one good one. They won't end up in, in, from my perspective, they won't end up in the publication. And if there is a person out there who is every morning reading our GitHub to look, <laughs> to look for a stupid idea, that then they'll somehow 
mention in a public forum, <laughs> that, that person has some psychological issues <laughs> and some time management issues that, that aren't really my concern. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mandana, you go ahead. Well, I think it's, it is key and important because this is basically what allows you to do archaeology easier later on, right? Yeah. It allows you to track and trace, and this is actually what makes the research transparent. Because right now, the research is not transparent, especially in linguistics, where none of this is ever shared, right? We don't know what the source data is. We cannot test and check the source data. We have no idea what steps have been applied that lead to the analysis, because already that, what you see there, is part of the analysis. So I think the division between complete data management versus analysis is one that is not correct because the way you manage your data, the way you divide your data up and chunk it and relate it to each other is already part of the analysis process. And this then in 50 years time will allow you to have a check on and it will see, oh, see, on the 21st of February, they went in the wrong direction. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> think just that, had, you know. I mean, I, I, I would also put in terms of version controlling, like on software yeah. or Wikipedia, what's the point of that? Like, like hopefully, most of the time, no one is wasting their time doing this like slice by slice uh, retrospective look at uh, anything because yeah, it's not a good use of human time. But um, it's it, but it is there, and it's 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 also well hidden, right? It's not in the way, but it's there if it becomes important. And I do think that's uh, useful. But but I would say that if someone said, look, I. You, 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 ha you have to make me choose between depositing my data in a public uh, archive or having a version control system for my workflow, I would definitely say, well, that's a false dichotomy, but <laughs> if you're going to make me choose, go with the, go with the, the archiving of your, of your um, data in a public repository. Just to come back to your point, many of us have tripped over mistakes from the, made by people in the past, and without a forensic analysis, a trial like we have here, we don't always understand how the mistakes of the past came about. We don't understand about how they came about. We're quite likely to commit them again. So it's very useful to have a forensic trail, as you say, to see where someone went wrong in the past. So I think that's really cool. Can I see if I can have two things? Yeah. First is it's a collaborative platform. So if you're writing code with other people, you having Git and GitHub as a way of merging your code together and ensuring that there is a master version of that code available that everyone agrees on is very important. And GitHub does that extremely well. That's the first thing. The second thing is, if people are using your code again, they can go, they may not want the final version. They may think, oh, they've, done, they've written some code here. That's very useful. Um, that was written six months ago. They can take the repository back to that stage and then build on top of the code that's being used at that point. So if your, your um, latent research is being funded publicly, I assume, and therefore people should be able to do that. Yeah, I agree with all that. I think that th those considerations are particularly important for software writing, which is what GitHub was designed to do. So um, one question is uh, just sort of practically speaking, would it not be better if there was some kind of version controlled etymological dictionary writing platform? Yeah, well that doesn't exist and GitHub, would, we more or less find easy enough to use that it it, it works for our purposes, but actually Matis just made me aware in the last couple of days about something called the Open Science uh, Framework, uh, and they seem to have designed a similar kind of version control workflow system, particularly with biologists and psychologists in mind, which might be more user-friendly than GitHub in terms of you know, using the command line potentially to, 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 to push and pull things. Uh, so I do think that in the near future, um, hopefully, but it will take all of us to be on board with this agenda, uh, having version control systems that are more easily usable by, uh, by disciplines other than computer science, uh, like epigraphy or 
you know, a religious studies is, is, is a good, would, would be a good development. And I bet, I mean, I, I really have only just barely looked at it, but I bet this open science framework is somehow specifically geared to biologists and psychologists, uh, that that might be a step towards the sort of work we're doing, but, but maybe more work needs to be done uh, in that direction as well. I think that, let's... Uh, good next talk. Yeah, because w then we'll be a tiny, tiny bit early. Yeah. So, um, please... Uh,